Chapter 2 Blackout The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap. T.S. Eliot, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock 1915. Tendrils of smoke wafted up above his head, then coiled around it and expanded into a thin veil that enveloped him. Fat flakes of soot stuck to his jacket like paint. His sword tarnished. It was a despicable way to treat such a gallant figure. Admiral Horatio Nelson was an 18th century British war hero a Royal Navy man who famously defeated the French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte's soldiers during the Battle of Trafalgar. In 1843, the British government erected a sandstone statue of Nelson in Trafalgar Square. Standing more than 150 feet tall and chiseled in Dartmoor granite, Nelson's column was flanked by four bronze Barbary lions. They were his guardians as he gazed south toward the Palace of Westminster. Lord Nelson was a tick on a tourist's London itinerary, an essential visit. Children from all over the world flocked to the monument. They gazed up at him and climbed atop his lions for a ride. Nelson was more than a symbol of the British victory over the French and Spanish. He was yet another reminder of the fall of Nazi Germany. If Adolf Hitler had invaded Britain, he had infamously planned to move the beloved statue from Trafalgar Square to Berlin as a show of force. It would have been an unbearable humiliation for the fiercely proud Londoners, and through the dark years of the Blitz and the bloody end of World War II, Nelson's likeness had taken on near totemic meaning. Today, seven years after the end of wartime aggression, Commander Nelson's statue was admired and positively revered by the city's populace. But that morning, December 5th, the Admiral quietly, discreetly disappeared. The dark, suffocating fog crept around him overnight and into the early hours of Friday. Temperatures dropped more than ten degrees from the previous day. At the same time, the barometric pressure suddenly rose to its highest level in more than a week. The night sky clouded and the thin fire in gas lamps flickered, highlighting the grey mist against the blackness. The pigeons fluttered around Nelson, kicking up small plumes of smoke. Chimneys puffing out fumes mixed with soot, furiously working to keep away the creeping cold, dotted the buildings around him. A member of Parliament hoping to start his day early, might peer upward as he entered the storied halls of British government, expecting to see Nelson welcome him, as he did every morning. The MP might squint through his spectacles as fat flakes of soot stuck to the lenses. He would notice that the smoke forged a shroud around the column and climbed upward. As the haze thickened, the war hero faded, then finally vanished. No matter the MP might mutter as he trudged toward Parliament. Just another London particular. On Friday, December the 5th, Londoners awoke to a blanket of grey fog covering the city. Along the River Thames, the smoke was not merely thick, but impenetrable. Just a few hours earlier, the government shut down all traffic on the river. Ships were ordered to stay docked. Commuters, shivering on the platform of the Liverpool Street Central Line underground station, could see less than fifty yards. But they still stepped onto their trains, ready for a full day of work. As the morning dragged on, instead of dissipating, the fog thickened. By early afternoon, the underground trains were running on their normal schedule, but the public buses were beginning to experience delays. The city's coal-burning railway engines vomited smoke. Traffic in central London slowed as drivers navigated through the fading daylight. Richmond Bridge was closed. In some parts of the city, all bus and trolleybus services were suspended indefinitely. At home and in offices, Londoners, hoping to stave off the frigid temperatures, sparked more than one million fireplaces piled with that brown coal. The city's power plants churned out electricity, fueled by cheap, lower-grade coal. Smoke poured from their chimneys. 
In the House of Commons, MPs debated the country's agriculture policy and then left a few hours early to avoid being abandoned by commuter rails. Two trains were delayed as they carried animals from Scotland to compete in the Smithfield Fat Stock Show at Earl's Court. Criminals began using the fog to their advantage. A group of burglars bound and gagged a female cleaner before cracking open a safe in an office building in Little Britain, a small district in central London. And there was an especially foreboding bit of news from Parliament. Ian MacLeod, the Minister of Health, sent a memo to all hospitals forbidding them from increasing their staff without prior approval. It must be shown that the increase is justified by exceptional circumstances such as serious undermanning, wrote MacLeod, and that the need cannot be met by reorganization or in any other way that would avoid the employment of additional staff. He also demanded they cut non-medical and non-nursing staffs by 5% over the next year. The government was trying to control its bloated debts. The fog was hardly mentioned in the city newspapers. They printed stories about compulsory crash helmets for motorcyclists and the introduction of a new stamp marking the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, but nothing about the smoke and fumes. The Manchester Guardian did proclaim... The first real fog of the year has enveloped London today, an old-fashioned pea super, thick, drab, yellow, disgusting. Yet the reporter described the conditions as rather pleasant for some drivers. It was possible to drive through the West End at a speed which left a wide safety margin and yet reach one's destination more quickly than usual. There was plenty of parking space, too. As Friday morning carried into the afternoon, the soot worked in concert with the mist. The flakes were large enough to be expelled by a puff from a lamplighter's mouth. Eyes ached, reddened in the fog's miasma. Throats burned as if specks of iron were caught in mid-swallow. Christmas lights on trees that decorated stores in the West End seemed to hang in mid-air, but holiday shoppers pushed on. Scientists at twelve pollution monitoring sites across Greater London recorded their daily readings. They found the new data troubling, particularly at a station on the Thames near Westminster Bridge. In less than twenty-four hours, the amounts of smoke and sulphur dioxide in the air had increased more than five times. More disturbing, the machines used by the Air Ministry to record air pollution tracked only sulphur dioxide and smoke. There were other deadly gases, carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, belched out by exhaust from thousands of vehicles that were going unmeasured, and diesel oil engines from the city's 8,000 double-decker buses spewed out vanadium compounds that caused bronchial irritation. As the chemicals in the air increased, so did the number of deaths. The fog drifted along the bottom of the Thames Valley, across the city, building its power. On Friday afternoon, it was mostly just an irritant, like those famous London fogs that had enchanted literature lovers for hundreds of years. But soon, a simple pea super would throttle the city. Rosemary Sargent gazed through the window of the red double-decker bus as it snaked through London. Less than an hour earlier, her teacher, Ms. Atkinson, had peered outside and frowned as the dark clouds swirled. Time to leave. The thirteen-year-old had just finished up lunch at Catford Central, a secondary school for girls in Catford, Lewisham, in the southeast part of the city. Rosemary thought the early release was a tad premature. It didn't seem like one of those fogs that would turn from inconvenient to alarming. But Rosemary was accustomed to the curt interruption of her secretarial studies. She was learning shorthand and typing, skills she could eventually use to secure a good office job. She was such a smart girl, if she made good grades, in a few years she would take the general education O-level and secretarial exams in individual subjects. Passing the O was considered a huge achievement and earned students and their parents bragging rights. But today... The exam was the last thing on her mind. Rosemary and the other girls bundled by their mothers in warm sweaters, long woolen socks and leather shoes were told to clear out. Teachers ordered them to board diesel buses recently rolled out by the government. There was no panic, just acceptance. 
She shivered. It just seemed so much colder than the day before. The fog was a nuisance to girls Rosemary's age. They often wore white petticoats under their cotton dresses, and the smoke tinted their hems black. It took hours for their mothers to clean them. Rosemary's hair was grimy, coated with soot. The stuff seeped into her skin like a thin layer of lotion that refused to be scrubbed away with soap flakes. It was god-awful, that fog. But she lived with it, as she would a lifelong flatmate. The sun hung in dust. Rosemary glowered. She could see the small particles floating, even without a real breeze. The bus windows were screwed tight, but that smell haunted her, acrid, filthy, and burning, like taking a whiff from the inside of a chimney's brick throat. The heavier the cloak of fog, the more it burned. It scorched her eyes and her nose, and then squeezed her throat. On the street, trendy debutantes wrapped their chiffon scarves across their mouths, their pearls dangling just below in a futile effort to stop the rancid air from choking them. But even their upscale woolen coats wouldn't cut the chill on this day. Londoners scurried along Bromley Road, gripped their shopping bags, their umbrellas, and their children. Rosemary's daily trip home to Bromley felt longer than its usual twenty minutes, but she couldn't imagine the diesel buses would be running much longer. The police might soon be forced to use torches, a practice adopted to guide vehicles through the fog. Their black overcoats, tall woolen hats, and white double-strapped fog masks were a common sight in the winter. The pollution tarnished their polished silver buttons. Dapper young men sporting teddy boy suits slipped downstairs to the underground, but the subway service might be suspended soon too. Rosemary stepped off the bus that afternoon just as the fog descended. She was already struggling to catch her breath. The air was dark yellow, not quite brown or black, but somehow thick. She turned her head quickly left and right. Aggravated, she squinted. She couldn't see her house. She couldn't even see her front gate, let alone her family's modest garden packed full of potatoes just under the surface. The smell had worsened to a dirty, sooty stench. It addled Rosemary's brain. She shuffled down the garden path, trying to orient herself. As she got closer, she scanned the front of her split-level terrace home, a small building on a block of mirror-image, red-brick houses with shared side walls, London's answer to its dense population. Rosemary stepped inside the front parlour to find her three siblings. The coal fireplace in that room was cold and dormant as always. Her family couldn't afford to light coal in two hearths, so they spent much of their time near the fire in the family room. The sergeants, a clan of six, weren't well off, but they weren't hard up either. They were upper working class. Rosemary's father, Albert, was a skilled cabinet maker who earned a good living. Rosemary didn't have a best pair of shoes or a school pair, just that one pair, those black, brogue-style shoes that seemed to last a lifetime. But her father could afford to have her feet measured, so she wasn't wearing hand-me-downs that pinched her toes or left gaps at her ankles, the bane of so many children her age. The fog was swirling at the window, an unwanted visitor lurking outside. Her mother Edna didn't switch on the radio for a news update. Why? A pea super was commonplace, almost customary, an entree to Christmas. Her only question, how late will Albert be tonight? Rosemary strolled into the family's small galley kitchen as her mother was preparing supper. Edna Sargent was a bona fide British matriarch, a spitfire with a temper, a wordsmith during rows with her husband. She and Albert had the occasional flare-ups during fifteen years of marriage, quarrels largely ignored by the children, but always peaceful at the end. There was a mutual respect between them, and Edna was always pleased to see him step across the threshold into their parlour, usually around half-past six. That Friday night, Rosemary looked through the room's glass pane. When the foggy air permeated a clear December night, Albert was frequently several hours late. Occasionally he was able to slip away from work to use a public telephone box, that red booth with a rotary phone inside outfitted with coin slots. But most of the time Albert didn't bother, he just began walking home. Edna wondered if his supper would need to be warmed later.
Rosemary and her siblings proceeded with their afternoon, looking forward to spending the weekend making holiday paper chains for the parlor fireplaces hearth with their father. A tree would soon arrive, with colorful lights and cheap tinsel. Rosemary suspected her parents had already finished their holiday shopping. She dreamed of new winter gloves lined with real rabbit fur. The fog couldn't stop the holiday preparations across the city. Fathers haggled over petite spruces in Covent Garden Market. Selfridges, Father Christmas in Toy Town window displays thrilled young children. Little girls begged their mothers for Mickey Mouse dolls. Boys gawked at Lionel trains in Hamley's toy store. London was dressed in swaths of red and green. It was a glorious time of year, especially in the midst of a painfully slow recovery from the war. In the sergeant household, Rosemary was the eldest child, and at thirteen, the most defiant. She had a sharp wit, complete with snide retorts, that bordered on insubordination, at least according to her mother. They had an uneasy kinship that was generally subdued, thanks to mediation from her father. After greeting her mother, Rosemary checked on the youngest sergeant, five-year-old Sue, then chatted with eight-year-old Malcolm and eleven-year-old David. The last glimmer of sun faded behind the gusts of grey clouds. The fog trickled through the cracks of the wooden frames, dragging along that stench, soon to be absorbed by the cotton curtains. Still, the family carried on with the evening, waiting for Albert. Six days a week, Rosemary's father toiled inside a London bus garage in Camberwell Green, about a twenty-minute bus ride from their home. Inside the red-brick warehouse, Albert Sargent mended the wood frames and upholstery on the city's diesel buses. He was a carpenter by trade, but after World War II employment was scarce, so he had joined up with a transport company. It was a good job. His wife didn't have to work, and he could support his four children. Tall, slender, and agile, the 42-year-old had been born four years before World War I. After his mother died, his father had raised him for a bit in the east end of London, a neighborhood synonymous with poverty, overcrowding, disease, and crime. The legend of Jack the Ripper, the notorious serial killer of the 1880s who was never caught and brought to justice, still haunted that area's crumbling buildings. Albert's father was a publican. He managed alehouses in the neighborhood and sampled his wares a bit too often, at least for a single parent. Rosemary's grandfather then moved Albert and his siblings to Dulwich Village in inner London, an area that would be devastated by German V-1 flying bombs and V-2 rockets decades later. Albert became a streetwise kid who grew into a conscientious man. When Albert was a boy, his father would scrape together enough money to take the family to visit an aunt and uncle on the island of Mercy in Essex on the Suffolk border. Rosemary's mother Edna lived there, and less than two years after meeting over coffee, she and Albert married. The year Rosemary was born, 1939, Twenty-nine-year-old Albert tried to join the army, along with more than one million other Britons at the outbreak of World War II. He failed the physical miserably. He had a nagging cough, a hack that could turn into a bark near a fire, especially a fire fueled by that cheap coal dust peddled by the government. He blamed it on his younger days, cycling through the streets of Dulwich in the foggy urban air when he was a teenager. His lungs had never been very healthy. When the British Army discovered he was plagued with respiratory issues, they rejected him. Too much of a risk. Instead, in 1939, he was assigned to an aircraft factory at Langley Airfield in Slough, a town about 20 miles west of central London. Albert worked in the upholstery unit inside massive aircraft hangars, plying his trade on the famous Supermarine Spitfires, the single-engine fighter planes manned by the Royal Air Force. There was irony in that assignment. He worked with hot glue most days, and the poisonous gases in the factory made him wheeze as much as any chlorine gas unleashed by the Germans during World War I. That was his job for much of the war, and though the hot glue was toxic, he felt proud knowing he had contributed to the war effort in some important way. The factory was too far to allow him to live at home in Bromley with his family, so he rarely returned to the city. Then the bombings began. Rosemary and her family were told to leave London. 
During the worst of the Blitz, government tried to empty the densely packed cities of mothers and children through a mass evacuation. About 800,000 young people were forced from their homes and moved to the countryside, where there were fewer targets for German bombers and much less devastation. Many were gone for up to six years for the remainder of the war. Rosemary's mother packed up the family's few belongings and moved with the children to rural West Murphy in Essex, where her parents lived. The children were without a patriarch in a strange town without friends. Rosemary's grandparents were devout Methodists. They attended church three times a day, most days. Rosemary and her brother came along. The humble local school was bursting with evacuees. There was little learning, but quite a lot of chaos. Rosemary thought of her father often while she was with her grandparents. She knew he was serving as an air raid warden in London, one of the men who proved themselves indispensable and heroic during the Blitz. Whenever the sirens blared in London, wardens like Albert helped people into the nearest shelter. Then, despite the bombs, shrapnel and masonry falling from the skies all around, they toured their sector to be sure all civilians had cleared out. When explosions leveled buildings, Albert pulled people out of rubble. A hero, Rosemary thought. She was back in a London grade school when he finally arrived home six years later in 1945. She had grown in inches and pounds. She was now the spitting image of him, blonde, attractive and slender, with deep-set eyes and soft features. It was a different life for them now that he was back. Her mother explained that many children lost fathers to the war. They were very lucky. Rosemary knew it. She was so grateful to be with him, to get to know him again. By the time the fog slowly invaded their home that Friday night in December 1952, Albert Sargent had been back with them for seven years. The teenager looked out the window for her father, a futile exercise considering the muddiness of the air. It was seven o'clock, ticking toward eight. Her mother quickly prepared dinner. She didn't seem worried. By nighttime, the fog was so thick that even a policeman's flashlight was nearly invisible. Rosemary knew it would take Albert hours to walk in that fog from his bus garage in Camberwell Green, about five miles away. Her mother wasn't concerned about the distance. It was that nagging cough of his, that hacking, forced, choking sound that was guttural. It was a clear sign of a bronchial infection. He just couldn't shake it in the winter. Most Londoners couldn't. It must have taken Albert at least two hours to walk those five miles home through the putrid air. And it was bleak, just below freezing outside. Rosemary knew his route through the hamlets filled with families warming themselves by fires. Well, after eight o'clock, Albert ploughed through the door, wheezing and desperately searching for breath. He dragged inside with him the mouldy air, and the family quickly bundled him in and shut the door. The fog lingered in the air after the door had been closed, and tendrils of it crept under the window frames which were closed tight against the chill outside. Rosemary grimaced as her father choked and wheezed, tears flowing down his cheeks. He was her hero, though they were still learning about each other. She saw an extraordinarily good man who was suffering. Her mother tried to calm him, asked him if he wanted supper. I don't want anything to eat. I'm going to bed, he replied. Her mother rolled her eyes. His plate was already on the table, but she didn't protest aloud. Albert climbed the steps to the small master bedroom. The rest of the family soon retired for the night to the chilly upstairs rooms. When Rosemary peered in to check on him, she saw her father stretched out, still fully clothed on her parents' bed. He was completely exhausted from the walk. Rosemary listened to each laboured breath as she lay in a twin bed in her small room. She was the eldest and rightly entitled to privacy. She could hear her brothers and sister next door in their bedroom. The boys climbed into their double bed while Sue curled up on her small bed. They were all cold. It was like an icebox upstairs, almost year-round. There was no heating, no fireplace, only a few woolen blankets that offered little comfort. The window's cheap frames ushered the warm air out and invited harsh wind inside. Her father's cough echoed through the house. 
It was a similar scene in houses, flats, and rooms all across London, including Maura and Stanley Crichton's small bedsit in North London. Maura Crichton was quite a willful woman, a cantankerous spirit simmering under the auburn locks of an Irish beauty. When something angered her, her husband naturally stepped backward just a foot or so. She relished their debates, the affectionate bickering, and he loved her. Her temperament was why Stanley had married the twenty-two-year-old earlier that year, that and her gorgeous singing voice. More a sweet Irish lilt illuminated whichever song she selected, whether she was singing in their tiny place in Finsbury Park or performing on stage in her native Waterford. And when she was well, her voice was as pure as the crystal that made her hometown famous. Not this night, though. Her voice, which had once produced beautiful melodies, had turned gruff and hoarse, and then she had no voice at all. That fog ruined it all, really. This wasn't a new problem for Maura, the coughing, just a whiff of smoke at their favourite pub forced her to gasp and choke. A thick pea super might send her to the hospital if she didn't stay inside. Maura's asthma was misery for a young singer and frightening for her husband, a police officer fresh from the academy. Twenty-year-old Stanley glanced out their window toward Finsbury Park. There it was, just as the forecasters on the radio had warned. The next few days were certain to be miserable for both of them, but for very different reasons. The Victorian gas lamps, peppered across more than one hundred acres of the park, should have stood tall and flickered, illuminating a young couple out for a stroll. Now the flames quivered like tiny fireflies from a children's book. The outlines of the light posts softened. The flames just lingered, engulfed by the smoke. The dark clouds drifted, approached Stanley's window pane, demanding to be allowed inside. Without invitation, the smoke slipped under the wooden frame, and into the room it dragged with it that bitter smell. Stanley turned and watched Maura throw on her winter coat. She tried to swallow a wet cough. He sighed and braced himself. You can't go out right now. That's mad, Stanley said. But you're going on shift. So can I, Maura snapped back. Yes, but I'm not coughing up that yellow mess. They were both scheduled to work that Friday. Stanley was assigned to patrol Holloway, a seedy district nearby. Maura was an auxiliary nurse at the Great Ormond Street Hospital Children's Charity, where she tended to young patients. They both worked the night shift. Maura wheezed, then glared at her husband. I'm going. Stanley raised his voice. By the time you get to the end of the road, I will have lost you. Maura repeated. But you're going to go. Yes, but I know my way better than you. Now come on, he insisted. Maura coughed, clutched her coat, flung open their front door, and disappeared. Stanley raced to the stoop. His eyes searched for her. She was stumbling on the street just a few feet away, clutching her throat. She suddenly dropped. The smoke slowly nudged past Stanley in his doorway. He jumped into the haze, lifted his wife, and carried her like a helpless child back inside. He laid her on their small bed and ordered that she control her breathing. She was quite beautiful to him, even in this state, and he was truly worried. But he had to go. He had joined the Metropolitan Police just a few months earlier, and he was still on probation. He had to leave right now, or risk losing this job they needed so desperately. She wheezed. Just stay there, he said. I'll come round in a few hours. Maura nodded. Stanley strapped on his white cotton face mask, opened the front door, and buttoned his black Yorkshire coat. He could feel the wooden baton inside his wool trousers, his only weapon. He readied himself for the mile-long walk to Hornsey Police Station on the other side of the park. He looked up at the window that guarded Mora from that noxious smoke. He couldn't see the light inside. The grey mist had smothered it. As night settled in, the people began showing up in emergency rooms all across London. Doctors saw a substantial increase in respiratory and cardiac diseases from the day before. Ambulance calls had increased by a third. As the temperatures plummeted, Londoners were forced to burn more and more of the cheap, dangerous, sooty brown powder. Almost 40% of Britain's coal supply was nutty slack. But Londoners, like their ancestors, 
were accustomed to coal-smudged skies and thick smog. Until the 13th century, wood was the main fuel source in London, but as the city expanded, the outlying trees were cut down for new homes, and wood soon vanished. Londoners then collected the so-called sea coal that washed ashore off the northeast coast of England near Newcastle. It was soft, bituminous coal that could heat their homes and fuel their factories. It was used to churn out a variety of products needed by the English, everything from beer to soap. Lime kilns blasted poisons into the air, but the cheap coal wasted most of its energy making smoke instead of providing heat. Sea coal contained high levels of sulfur, so when it was burned it released large amounts of sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide, and soot into the air. If the weather conditions were right, smoke from London's thousands of chimneys and factories combined with the fog to create a deadly concoction that could last for days and kill for months. None of this was a surprise to Londoners. They had been coping with the ill effects of burning this cheap coal for centuries. In 1257, the British royals were warming their drafty castle in Nottingham with coal fireplaces when huge clouds of smoke disseminated throughout the building. The fumes forced Queen Eleanor from the castle. In 1272, King Edward I forbade the use of sea coal by threatening to torture or execute anyone caught with it. The royal edict didn't stop Londoners, even when the first offender was executed. Most couldn't afford the expensive wood. It was simply a matter of economics. Anthracite coal, the black stuff, was of higher quality, but too costly. The royals offered commoners no real solution, only intimidation. King Richard III and Henry V both had attempted to ban sea coal, but failed. As London expanded over the centuries, so did its dependence on coal. It became the dominant source of heat, and by the 15th century, Londoners were constantly overcome with smoke. 17th century astrologer John Gadbury kept a daily weather diary and labelled particularly smoggy days great stinking fogs. 300 years later, Australian scientist and historian Peter Brimblecombe compared those dates in November 1679 with death records for London during the same time period. The highest death rates coincided with weeks following those great stinking fogs. It was evident that smog was a killer. It also attacked young Londoners, even through the 1950s, the fogs blighted out the sun, the best source of vitamin D for growing kids. Without vitamin D, the body can't absorb calcium and young bones don't develop correctly. Children were afflicted with bowed legs and deformed pelvises, ribs and limbs. The fogs created an epidemic of rickets in poor kids who had diets without calcium-rich foods. During the 1600s, more than half of the city's children had rickets. In 1661, influential writer John Evelyn distributed a treatise, one of the earliest works on air pollution, entitled Fumifugium, or The Inconvenience of the Air and Smoke of London Dissipated. In the pamphlet, Evelyn begged King Charles II and Parliament to do something about the burning of coal in London. And what is all this but that hellish and dismal cloud of sea coal, he wrote, so universally mixed with the otherwise wholesome and excellent air that her inhabitants breathe nothing but an impure and thick mist accompanied with a fuliginous and filthy vapour. Despite Evelyn's pleas, the government did nothing. Religious leaders were even executed over those fogs. In the 1600s, the Church of England's Archbishop of Canterbury, William Lord, fined several coal-burning brewers so he could repair smoke damage to St. Paul's Cathedral. He was beheaded in 1645. When the Industrial Revolution reached Britain in the late 1700s, coal was king and the environment was irrevocably damaged. By the 19th century, more than a million Londoners were shoveling soft coal onto their grates. Winter fogs were persistent, and so was the smoke. In 1873, smog smothered the city for days, 
Almost 300 people died from bronchitis, sending the mortality rate soaring 40% beyond normal. Another fog six years later blocked the light from the city for four months. Londoners in the East End were usually the most affected because of the dense population, cheaply made buildings, and the plethora of factories. It was also low-lying, so the fog took longer to burn off. By the turn of the 20th century, smoky fog was endemic. In 1905, Dr. Henry Antoine de Vaux coined the word smog. During both world wars, smoke became a defense strategy. In some areas of England, pollution was produced with the intention of masking the city from enemy bombers, like the smoke screens that armed forces used to hide the location of military units during combat. As German planes circled British cities, local factories churned out smoke, creating a dense layer of protection, a blackout of pollution. There were critics like influential members of the National Smoke Abatement Society, NSAS, a lobby group that had existed in various forms since the 1880s. The NSAS admitted that smoke screening could be an effective strategy, but argued that the smoke was as much of a nuisance to British forces defending cities from the air and on the ground, and the pressure on industry to accelerate productivity during the war caused even more smoke. Factory owners began to force their steam boilers to exceed their design capacity. Smoke restrictions were generally ignored. Pollution dirtied the air, not just in Britain, but also around the world. And as industry ramped up and factories got bigger in scale, they used more coal and spewed out more carcinogens. The smog got more deadly. But as disgusting as it was, black smoke was also appreciated by some, like novelists. Deadly fog was the muse for famed Victorian authors. They harnessed it as a literary device, symbolizing confusion and claustrophobia, coupled with oppression and the blurring of roles in society. Charles Dickens weaved fog into his plots, molding it as a living character. When Robert Louis Stevenson penned Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he used the fog itself to show the mutation of identity. The nightmarish landscape protected the murderous Mr. Hyde as he committed his crimes. When the fog drifted away, the civilized Dr. Jekyll reappeared. And the mention of Jack the Ripper evoked images of Victorian Whitechapel, smothered under an ominous cloak of fog. Never mind that each of the murders happened on perfectly clear nights. Swirls of fog were romantic and beguiling to Londoners, whose affinity for an open fire was virtually a requirement for being British. A coal fire in the hearth was an old companion who called on them every winter. Fog could be a nuisance, yes, but it also became the city's trademark. For centuries, few in England had paid much attention to those who cautioned about the dangers of bad air. The National Smoke Abatement Society had harassed the government for years about air pollution, but in the past, Parliament had only responded with ineffective committees and rules which promoted the status quo. Sooty buildings, greasy hair, and dirty shirts were understood to be the price of progress. Smoke particles had floated through London's air since medieval times, and Britons didn't expect that to change. But even the most stalwart gas lamplighters, those men who illuminated London streets on a gloomy night with a torch on a pole, would likely admit the fog on this day was certainly more than just a bad pea super. It was dark, dismal now, on this cold night in early December. It seemed similar to those blackouts the British government imposed during the Blitz, when all lights had been extinguished, homes, factories, street lamps, even the Palace of Westminster, where the order originated. The blackouts had acted as a sort of camouflage from German bombers searching for targets in the darkness. Those nights had been frightening for Londoners. Cars travelling without headlights careened into pedestrians. Residents tumbled down stairs. Criminals took advantage of a vulnerable city. It was prudent to stay inside behind locked doors. But there wasn't a government-ordered blackout this Friday night, the first night of the fog. 
There were no signs posted signifying when the lights could be turned back on. Tonight, the London air was black, thick like ink, and there was no way to gauge when the fog would end. Meteorologists predicted it would blow away by the next day. It wouldn't. Acrid smoke churned from the chimney of the dreary apartment at 10 Rillington Place. The plumes, pushed down, tumbled over John Reginald Christie's private garden. If Reg were to glance down from his kitchen window that night, as he often did, his small plot would be almost indistinguishable, smothered by the fog. The swirls born from the coal were bewitching, and the fog was once his accomplice, such a reliable conspirator. He drew inspiration from its noxious fumes. It had helped him murder her, the second woman, after all. The back garden's broken pots, dead plants, and general rubbish, usually visible out his back window, vanished in the fog. The fence, which could barely stand on its own, faded like a lost memory. If Reg screwed up his eyes, adjusted his spectacles, and made careful calculations, he might visualize something odd about that fence. A strange stick that helped brace it. It was a bone. A thigh bone, actually. It didn't belong to the first girl, the flirty one, who had been infatuated with his uniform. It came from the other one, the woman who had arrived at his home the following year and never left. It was her thigh bone, bracing a section of Reg's fence. So many people had strolled past it over the years, including Scotland Yard investigators. If they had just looked down at her bone, haphazardly lodged into the dirt, perhaps he would have been stopped. If only they had noticed. Muriel Amelia Eady had been so different from his first, short, plump, and quite average-looking. She had short, wavy brown hair and a squished face, and at age thirty-one she was older than Ruth first. Muriel didn't want his money. She had a good job. Actually, that's where they met. And she didn't need his company. She had plenty of male companions. This affair, as Reg would call it, would require some effort and planning. And patience. He plotted. Muriel was quiet and restrained as she worked on the assembly line at Ultra Electric Limited, a factory in northwest London tasked with building radios before the war began. She helped construct military equipment, including parts for the combat planes used to attack the Nazis. It had been 1944 when Reg met her. That summer, in Normandy, the Allies launched the largest seaborne invasion in history known as D-Day, beginning the liberation of parts of Nazi-occupied Europe. There was hope in London, prayers that this war would soon be over. In a factory spanning more than 150,000 square feet, packed with more than a 1,000 workers, Reg had noticed her right away. He gazed at Muriel as she stood in the canteen. He asked her to join him for a cup of tea. She invited a male friend over. Reg smiled. He invited them both to tea at his home with his wife, Ethel. Muriel and her friend visited 10 Rillington Place several times, happily chatting about life in London. The four of them even went to the movies. He could be charming when he needed to be. Slowly, Muriel grew to trust Reg. She believed that he was honorable. He was a former war reserve policeman, he mentioned. That quiet, peaceful thrill he experienced from his time with Ruth, that's what Reg yearned for again. But this time would be very different. He would stay in control. He was willing to wait to plan appropriately. As October 1944 began, the weather turned foggy and smoky as it often did that time of year. Rain soaked the streets, dripped down the gas lamps. Muriel coughed quite often. Reg noticed and smiled, feigning concern. He was working it all out now. A really clever murder, he would later murmur. Much cleverer than the first. At home, away from his wife's inquisitive glances, Reg prepared for Muriel. He found a mask, and then a square glass jar, punched two holes in the tin lid, and attached two rubber tubes. One led to steaming water in the jar, which was infused with Friar's balsam, a compound that smelled like alcohol. It was used to treat breathing issues like bronchitis. It might smell familiar to her, perhaps soothing. But there was more to his invention. 
He attached the other rubber tube to the mask. That hose was longer, and its source wasn't immediately evident to someone sitting at his kitchen table. In fact, that second tube stretched behind his stove to the gas pipe projecting out of the wall. Inside it was coal gas. When the metal seam cap was unscrewed, it churned out lethal carbon monoxide, the same stuff that puffed out of his chimney on a cold night. It was a brilliant plan, really. Reg stashed his equipment and waited. Muriel complained about her cough again one morning. Reg smiled and explained he had a medical background. He had earned a first aid certificate and kept a book handy from St. John Ambulance for reference. I have something that can cure that cough, he promised. She was grateful and agreed to meet him without her male friend at his home over the weekend. He arranged to take sick leave from the factory, nine days beginning on Monday, October 2nd. Before he left, he told Muriel to come to his home that Saturday for a treatment when he knew his wife would be working. She worked at Osram's light bulb factory as a typist during the war. Just a few weeks earlier, Londoners had turned back their clocks for daylight saving time. The evenings were longer, the light faded earlier. Muriel lunched with her aunt on Saturday, October 7th. Around four, she slipped on a jacket and quickly left the house, calling out, I shan't be late. It was a week before her thirty-second birthday. Her aunt would clearly remember that detail. Reg opened the door. Muriel had dressed nicely for him, a black dress with a pink collar and a camel-coloured coat. He welcomed her, invited her to sit in the kitchen. Ethel's gone to visit family, he said. Reg proudly showed her the jar with the tube and explained that her cough would be cured in no time. He handed her the tube and put a scarf over her head. He suggested she breathe deeply. The friar's balsam will help, he assured her. She didn't seem to notice that other tube, the one that stretched to his coal gas pipe. Reg reached over and released the ball clip he had left clamped on the tube. It might seem strange that a woman with any common sense could have trusted him. It was simply a testament to the confidence he was able to muster when properly motivated. The coal gas pipe pumped out carbon monoxide as she inhaled the friar's balsam. She had no suspicions at all she was about to die, he later said. Soon she went limp. She wasn't dead. That wouldn't have suited Reg, but she was helpless. This was the moment I was waiting for, he remembered. He lifted her carefully. He laid her on the bed and did what he had done with Ruth, except this time he reached for a pair of stockings. It was part of the excitement. He knew its potential, what it would feel like to squeeze her throat until she was gone. It took relatively little energy to kill her, which surprised him. His body wasn't healthy. He had loads of aches all over, and he was recovering from bronchitis. He hoped to kill her with the least amount of effort. She never opened her eyes. There was no fight. She made no objections at all. It was the most exhilarating feeling. No regrets, he said. I dismissed it from my mind. His inner hubris was peculiar, particularly for a cowardly man. For the second time in my life, I looked down at the still, lifeless form of an attractive woman who had died at my hands, he said. Muriel spent several hours inside his wash house in the garden, but he didn't want to keep her there long. That wouldn't be smart. Later that evening, with Ethel still out, Reg quickly disposed of her in a familiar manner, plopping her into a shallow grave near the back of the yard. They were so close to each other, Muriel and Ruth, crammed together in that tiny garden, along with an array of animal bones from pets long gone. But tonight, more than eight years later, in December of 1952, the first night of that god-awful fog, Reggie's trophies evaporated in the smoke created by the coal fires inside Tenrillington Place. For now, the women were only recollections to him, beautiful memories. And yet, quite soon, they would resurface.